family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is the second part to chapter five. Family, church, and charity. Regan's position on volunteerism was willfully equivocal, variously seeking to exploit and disable the energies of a nonprofit sector that had first become a target of government funding under the Great Society agenda. Even while he endlessly exhorted nonprofits to pick up the slack from failing public services then, Regan did everything in his power to undercut the nonprofit infrastructure that had grown out of and beyond the Great Society Community Action Programs. With their proximity to the civil rights movement and the New Left, these evidently were not the kinds of voluntary initiative that Regan wished to foster. Reflecting on the legacy of Regan's first few years in government, Lester Salomon calculates that Regan ended up cutting the equivalent of $115 billion in real terms to the nonprofit sector between 1982 and 1985. The Omnibus Budget and Reconciliation Act of 1981 led to huge cuts for grant-in aid programs to state and local government, the first such cuts in almost a quarter of a century, and transformed a wide variety of categorical grants, that is, grants with budgets allocated to fixed programs, into block grants that gave states less money, but more discretion in how to spend it. These reforms eviscerated the smaller, more militant non-profit, non-profits that had benefited from Great Society funding largesse and had a particularly devastating effect on health care services for the poor. During Regan's first term, it is estimated that cuts to health care block grants averaged from 20 to 35 percent nationwide. Grants in aid to state and local governments for preventative health programs declined by 22 percent, for health resources by 42 percent, for health services by 22 percent, for alcohol, drug abuse, and mental health by 34 percent, and for Medicaid by 7 percent. At stake here was something more than a, than a deference to limited government. Regan was profligate in other areas of federal spending and indifferent to the soaring budget deficit, squandering billions on military and tax concessions, much to the dismay of some of his closest advisors. More than a testament to fiscal conservatism, Regan's cuts to the nonprofit sector were motivated foremost by a political animus against the legacy of great society welfare programs. Upon entering office, Regan quickly moved to shut down the Community Service Administration, which had become, begun life as the Great Society's Office of Economic Opportunity, the body responsible for funding community action programs, and replaced it with a new voluntary sector agency named Action. He then appointed a particularly ardent conservative as head of the agency who made a special effort to stop funds going to left-leaning activist organizations. According to new rules issued by Action, organizations could not use federal funds to engage in the ill-defined activity of political advocacy and would have to isolate funds that they used toward that purpose if they received as little as 5% of their operating budget from the government. This stipulation was evidently aimed at the kind of public interest litigation that had grown out of and alongside the radical welfare activism of the 1960s and 70s. In particular, the various Supreme Court challenges that had undermined the power of state welfare agencies to police morality. It was designed to stifle precisely the kinds of public policy activism that AIDS service organizations would engage in, despite all the odds throughout the 1980s. Alongside this general prohibition on political advocacy, the Regan administration outlined a number of specific limits to the kinds of nonprofit initiative the government was willing to finance. In 1988, Senator Jesse Helms convinced Congress to pass an amendment designed to prevent the federal government from funding any AIDS, education, or prevention resource that would promote or encourage directly or indirectly homosexual activities. In 
The amendment, which was approved with overwhelming majorities by the Senate and the House, applied to the HHS, the major funder of AIDS prevention material at federal, state, and local levels. Without prompting from the, from the federal government, the Center for Disease Control, CDC, responded to this decision by adopting its own guidelines restricting the appearance of sexually explicit content in any of the publications it funded. Henceforth, all CDC prevention materials were expected to include warnings about the dangers of promiscuity and IV drug use and propound the virtues of abstinence while safe sex messages somehow had to be conveyed without depicting an anus, a vagina, or a penis. Federal and state government generally refused to fund explicit safe sex material, obliging AIDS service organizations to create separate accounts for all AIDS prevention initiatives they might engage in. These restrictions on the funding of AIDS prevention material were introduced alongside a prohibition on the use of federal tax dollars to fund free needle exchange programs, also sponsored by HELMS, and a gag rule preventing federally funded health professionals from providing information and referrals relating to abortion. Together, these rules carefully delineated the nature of the nonprofit services that the government was willing to fund and, prov and progressively narrowed the space of maneuver in which they could operate, particularly around questions of sexuality. The equivocations of Reagan's position on the nonprofit sector became, become legible if we understand that as part of a more ambitious maneuver to refashion the very shape of social welfare. The Helms Amendment and other restrictions on federal funding were designed to counter the, the perceived anti-family bias of great society social programs and to channel the flow of social service contracts back into programs that promoted the family, heterosexual monogamy, and abstinence outside marriage. Not incidentally, the imposition of various moral restrictions on nonprofits occurred at a time when the religious right was itself claiming a growing share of social service contracts, while actively seeking and achieving exemptions from federal laws relating to sexual freedom, a theme I will explore further in Chapter 7. In the late 1980s, for example, the Catholic Hospitals of New York applied for government funds to provide care for AIDS patients, but refused outright to comply with state guidelines to counsel patients on safer sex. Although strictly illegal, this refusal to comply with state guidelines did not prevent the church from receiving funds, and Governor Mario Cuomo tacitly overlooked it. Such claims to religious exceptionalism would later be celebrated as expressions of religious freedom and institutionalized by Clinton's Charitable Choice Act of 1996, which formally exempted religious organizations from federal anti-discrimination laws with respect to employment. In retrospect, it, it appears evident that the widening of the space of religious freedom has been contemporaneous with a growing number of restrictions placed on a dissident sexual politics. Religious freedom to impose moral laws asserted at the same time as sexual freedom from moral laws diminished. The only implies, the one implies the other. The proliferation of moral exclusion zones designed to channel nonprofit services toward the promotion of monogamous heterosexuality was strictly consonant with the Reagan administration's efforts to reinstitutionalize the private family as the primary locus of care. As noted by Jennifer Parks, the deinstitutionalization movement, the glorifying of home or community based care as the answer to hospital or nursing home care, is a homecoming in more than one sense of the word. While patients are indeed coming home sooner, home care is also a return to a way of care taking that is part of our social history, a return to a household economy of service that was always rigorously structured along the lines of gender and race. The valorization of home based care, one might add, is more than a little reminiscent of the American poor law tradition of family responsibility, which we have seen was actively invoked to enforce the provision of care by family members well into the early 20th century. It is no coincidence that at the very moment Regan was pushing through legislation to shorten the length of hospital states and return care work to, home, to the home, he also made it legal for states to revive and enforce centuries-old filial obligation laws as a way of recouping Medicaid and Medicare costs. In 
As we saw in Chapter 3, family responsibility statutes fell into relative disuse after the passage of the Social Security Act of 1935 and were explicitly overridden by the Medicaid Statute of 1965, which forbade recourse to family support in the year of public welfare. As governor of California and a vocal critic of great society welfare programs, Regan had fulminated against the repeal of these laws. As president, he turned family responsibility into a watchword of social welfare reform and encouraged the states to enforce such laws wherever possible. The budgetary savings made possible by Regan's revival of filial obligation laws appear to have been symbolic at best. It turns out that extracting money from the indigent families of indigent patients is easier said than done. But in any event, the reinstitutionalization of the private family took took place in large part by default through the negative impact of dwindling social service and foreshortened hospital states not to mention the inertia of gender roles that in the throes of economic crisis seemed to slot back effortlessly into place. These then were the boundaries in which nonprofits were forced to operate in the early years of the AIDS epidemic. If devolution to the nonprofit sector had become the guiding principle of Regan-era social service provision, such expressions of empowerment were to be strictly channeled into the reinvigorated institutional forms of family, church, and charity, the relationship of the early AIDS service organizations to this governmental agenda was equivocal at best. While on the one hand, organizations such as GMHC seem to have perfectly internalized the injunction to self-care, they also transgressed the moral limits to service provision prescribed by the state and to this extent resisted assimilation. At a time when the neoliberal religious conservative coalition was seeking to reassert the private responsibilities of the family, AIDS activists invented relations of care beyond the boundaries of family or kinship and promoted forms of safe sex that refused the alternative between abstinence or heterosexual monogamy. These practices of self-care often brought them into direct conflict with the church and the state. Most notable in this regard was Act Up's Stop the Church Action in which activists staged a die-in in the pews of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York to protest Cardinal O'Connor's vocal public stance against homosexuality and abortion. The action was controversial even within the ranks of ACT UP and today appears unthinkable, but it was offensive only because it so precisely targeted the nexus of theological and neoliberal forms of government that was to take shape over the following years. At its most incisive, the AIDS activism of the 1980s asked what the familial connotations of home might mean to those who both refused productive, monogamous heterosexuality and were threatened with actual homelessness. It was more than ironic that home-based care was being promoted as an official alternative to the public hospital system at a time when affordable housing was becoming increasingly inaccessible. Deinstitutionalization itself was partially responsible for the sharp increase in homelessness that was recorded in the early 1980s, as patients who had been under long-term state care were offloaded onto the streets. But to this was added the pressure from tax-subsidized real estate investment and a strategy of planned obsolescence with regard to public housing. Again, the tensions were felt acutely in New York, the city that most precociously and ruthlessly embraced asset inflation as a new model of economic growth. New York's homelessness problem had a very prosaic source. Note Perot and Guillain. Mental patients were turned out into the streets. Funds for subsidized housing for the poor were cut. Even while financial benefits were available for housing for the well-to-do in New York City, developers of commercial office space and expensive condominiums benefited from handsome tax breaks. In Chapter 4, we saw how the focus of neoliberal monetary policy on stimulating asset inflation lent itself to the reassertion of the private family as a vector of wealth transmission. Gentrification as urban strategy went hand-in-hand with the revalorization of inheritance, and this confluence of factors proved doubly marginalizing to those who both resisted the family as a sexual institution, 
and were deprived of family wealth. In the early years of the epidemic, homelessness was a very real problem for AIDS patients of all classes, as many found themselves unable to pay rent after leaving their jobs or evicted from long-term rentals by homophobic, homophobic landlords. AIDS service organizations such as GMHC successfully confronted the problem of middle-class homelessness in the early years of the epidemic by creating collective home-based care services for the dying, but were much slower to address the endemic problems of housing precarity facing the HIV-infected poor. This task would be taken up by the Housing Committee of ACT UP, which saw the decline of public housing and social services in general as key issues for AIDS activism. In one of its first actions, the Housing Committee occupied the lobby of the New York Trump Tower, a monument to the investment magnate Donald Trump, in order to expose the contradiction between tax-subsidized real estate development and homelessness in the city. But the committee quickly sensed the limitations of such punctual theatrical interventions when it came to issues of social provision, and in the space of a few short years morphed from a direct action group to an independent housing service provider for impoverished AIDS patients. As a response to the public housing crisis, the initiative was small and no doubt inadequate to the scale of the problem. But by drawing the connections between homelessness, familial homophobia, and poverty, the Housing Committee refused to reprivatize the politics of care and, and in so doing, challenged the very rationale of home-based care. Volent <sighs> Volenti non-fit injuria, AIDS and the uninsured risk. Beyond the issues of home and homelessness, the HIV-infected body appeared almost to somatize the peculiar risk exposures of Reagan-era health reform as the neoliberal attack on welfare economics progressively undermined existing forms of health insurance. The percentage of Americans who were covered by private work-based health insurance peaked in 1982 at the height of the Volcker recession and then progressively declined as a result of the long-term restructuring of the workforce. In the new economic environment created by recession, corporate downsizing, and the relocation of mass manufacture offshore, employers who in the past had done everything in their power to retain a permanent workforce were now no longer convinced of the economic benefits of offering generous health insurance. In response to new competitive pressures, employers resorted to various strategies to decrease their inflating medical care costs. Some shifted costs to older employees and retirees. Some dropped their coverage of dependents or sought to rationalize existing programs by delegating them to health maintenance organizations, HMOs. Some employers vetted new personnel for pre-existing medical conditions, while many others simply divested themselves of health care costs by employing uninsured workers on short-term contracts. The historical exceptionalism of the American health insurance system, that is, its heavy reliance on a work-based system of private insurance under public auspices, made it particularly vulnerable to the changing nature of employment in the post-Fordist era. As long-term industrial labor steadily declined in favor of short-term temporary employment in both the professional and low-wage service sectors, the American public-private system of health care insurance also steadily diminished affecting all levels of the income scale. In the meantime, private insurers who in the past had been willing to act like state guaranteed substitutes for public health care began to abandon their commitment to social insurance principles. The large Fordist corporations that had once subscribed to the redistributive tenets of risk pooling and community rating now began introducing specific premiums for different age groups and occupations while smaller insurance companies began cherry-picking younger, healthier employees by offering them cheaper premiums. The inevitable effect of such market fragmentation was to undermine the very logic of social insurance, which works best across large populations, and to narrow the pool of people able to afford insurance in the first place. By the 1980s, notes public health historian Dorothy Porter Fewer Americans were insured at an ever-increasing cost. The numbers of uninsured grew to dramatic proportions, 
Furthermore, as white collar and unemployment grew with recession at the end of the decade, a much broader band of Americans experienced episodes of being without insurance. Beyond structural changes to the employment contract, however, private insurers were also introducing new kinds of exemption into their policies. Emboldened by neoliberal critiques of moral hazard and a public health discourse that was increasingly focused on the ill effects of lifestyle choice, private insurers began to reintroduce notions of fault into their policies, reserving special caps or exclusions for accidents that could be construed as the result of self-inflicted harm. This new attention to lifestyle choice was bound to have a particularly heavy impact on the HIV infected. Given the overwhelming association between the AIDS epidemic and irresponsible lifestyle choices. As late as 1982, in fact, scientists were still debating whether the strange new immune condition afflicting young gay men could be attributed to the repeated lifestyle stresses of dancing, poppers, and sodomy. And even after the virus was officially identified in 1984, its privileged mode of transmission through sex or drug use continue to attract a special kind of moral opprobrium. It is hardly surprising then that in the early 1980s, many private insurers introduced special AIDS caps into their group policies, placing absolute limits on recoverable costs for AIDS care, while others created valenti exclusions that reserved coverage only for the innocent victims of involuntary infection through blood transfusion. In an era where public health experts saw behavioral risks as a form of self-inflicted harm, it seemed that AIDS infected dr- AIDS infection through drug use or sexual contact represented the ultimate lifestyle choice and the ultimate confirmation of the maxim valenti non fit injuria. <clears throat> As the full extent of the AIDS epidemic became clear then, many employed gay men found themselves outright excluded from health insurance coverage or lost available coverage when they could no longer work. These men could only then become eligible for Medicaid after they had spent spent down all their assets on out-of-pocket medical care. The refusal of the competitive private market to ensure the voluntary risk of AIDS infection, a refusal that neoliberal legal theorists such as Richard Posner and Thomas Philipson would qualify as a rational market failure, meant that the public welfare system became the de facto insurer of last resort for HIV-AIDS patients. By 1993, Medicaid, which covers approximately 10% of all U.S. health expenditures, accounted for fully 25% of all AIDS-related costs, and Medicaid itself was supplemented by a specific emergency health care program, the Ryan White Care Act of 1990 designed to provide a last resort backstop for uninsured AIDS sufferers. Increasingly, private insurers saw AIDS patients as uninsurable risks and ceded their costs to the public sector, a division of labor that reserved the most profitable risks for private insurance markets and inevitably exacerbated the inflation of healthcare costs in the public sector. At a time when the ranks of the workplace the workplace uninsured were swelling, then the social insurance system was itself. Then the social insurance system was itself entering a period of crisis. Regan's 1981 cuts to social services allowed states to tighten their eligibility criteria for Medicaid, meaning that many more Americans were left with no insurance at all and placed intolerable pressures on the already overcrowded emergency rooms of public hospitals. Television and newspaper reports in the early 1990s regaled their audience with stories of private hospitals unceremoniously dumping uninsured patients onto the nearest public hospital, of seriously ill patients being discharged without care from emergency rooms or transferred across state lines. Again, the particular impact of this crisis on AIDS patients was exacerbated by the fact that HIV-infected drug users, non-heterosexuals, and sex workers had come to represent the undeserving ill in the eyes of the general public. With or without health insurance coverage, patients suspected of being infected with the HIV virus were routinely escorted out of emergency rooms and refused care by primary physicians. But the impact of institutional risk 
protection on the unfolding of the AIDS epidemic went far beyond the question of insurance coverage. The growing fragmentation and restriction of health insurance shaped the very profile of the epidemic in the United States. Deciding in advance who would be visible to CDC epide epidemiologists and who would remain uncounted. For AIDS to be recognized as an identifiable illness in the first place, it was necessary for a sufficient number of people of a certain demographic to have access to premium medical practitioners in direct contact with the highest levels of public health surveillance. In the words of Cindy Pat Patton, it is a devastating historical accident that HIV was first noticed among well-cared for gay men. <clears throat> AIDS, a diagnosis of early death and the previously healthy, could only be recognized in a group on the verge of achieving the social status of healthy. The CDC was first notified of the disease that would later be called AIDS when an immunologist working at UCLA's Medical Research Center treated a number of young white gay men who appeared to be suffering from a similar kind of immune deficiency. The immunologist was sufficiently apprised of the official channels of public health surveillance to know that he should contact the local health department and inform a colleague working at the CDC. The most immediate evidence of some common denominator linking the men was the fact that they were young, white, previously healthy, and gay. But these men also shared something else in common. Their health insurance was generous enough to cover consultations with a well-connected specialist in an elite medical center. It was this detail above all else that made them visible to the official public health system. In retrospect, it is clear that these men, although certainly at high risk, were not representative of the AIDS epidemic as a whole, which also included many intravenous drug users and their partners, and were far from representative of the gay community most affected by AIDS, which also included many non-white, non-middle class, uninsured, and publicly insured people, bisexuals, and transgender men and women. The effect of this differential access to privately insured health care was to distort the, the epidemiological profile of the HIV crisis at the very moment it became visible to public consciousness in the 1980s. The public health specialists D.C. Desjardins, S.R. Friedemann, and J.L. Sutherland have found evidence that HIV AIDS was widespread among intravenous drug users during the 1970s well before the first cases were detected among white gay men. The research indicates that seroprevalence among injecting drug users hovered somewhere around 20% between 1975 and 1977, increasing to 50% between 1978 and 1982. I didn't know that. This shadow epidemic disproportionately affected lower-income black and Hispanic drug users. That would be why I didn't know that. Those who were least likely to be employed or have a permanent residence, disposable income, and thus access to clean injecting materials. Their deaths were invisible to the private physicians who reported AIDS cases to state health departments because they rarely had access to continuous medical care in the first place. Already suffered from a high rate of infections unrelated to HIV and often only reached a hospital emergency room in the final stages of illness where they appeared to be suffering from complications from pneumonia. As noted by Kathy Cohen, this population most often received their care from Medicaid mills or the emergency rooms of teaching hospitals that were so critical in identifying this disease among referred and formally admitted gay patients. For the women who contracted HIV in the early years of the epidemic, a disproportionate number of whom were low-income Black and Latina, Access to medical care was complicated by the fact that the opportuni opportunistic infections that accompanied AIDS in women were not recognized by the CDC. As the nation's premier public health institution, the CDC constructed the, epidemi the epidemiological facts of the disease, and in so doing provided both public and private insurers with the classifications they needed to design, needed to design coverage. AIDS is a syndrome that can manifest itself in a number of symptoms that differ widely by class, gender, access to preventative care such as vaccinations, environmental factors, and contact with animals. 
Up until 1992, AIDS was officially defined as the presence of antibodies to HIV, combined with a number of indicator diseases that had originally been observed in young white gay men. This restrictive definition meant that the numbers of women infected with HIV were grossly underreported well into the 1990s. Many women were never sent to be tested in the first place because they did not suffer from the same kinds of opportunistic infections as men. A retrospective look at medical records, however, seems to indicate that significant numbers of low-income women died of AIDS in the 1970s and 80s, without provoking any alarm on the part of public health officials. Reports of unexplained spikes in mortality from pneumonia, tuberculosis, rare, rare parasitic infections, nephritis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease were recorded among low-income women in New York City, Newark, Hartford, and Washington, precisely those cities that would come to be recognized as epicenters of the epidemic from the late 1970s into the 1980s. It is, pos it is plausible that these cases did not come to light in the 1970s for the same reason that junky pneumonia was not recognized as the sign of an emerging infectious disease. The people in question had such precarious access to health care that news of their death was never communicated to public health authorities. But in the 1980s, these women remained invisible to public health surveillance because the CDC's own definition of the syndrome excluded them from consideration. The gender bias of CDC epidemi epidemi epidemiology I have a hard time with that word, my goodness, had immediate material and self-reinforcing effects. In many states, eligibility for health care and other benefits depended on official diagnosis of AIDS. So women who were gravely ill but not recognized as HIV positive were routinely excluded from Medicaid, Social Security, Disability Insurance, and other support services for people with AIDS. These low-income women were thus defined as uninsurable risks twice over. Their marginalization from a healthcare system that provided only last resort, emergency care for the underinsured and uninsured meant that their illnesses were barely visible to federal epidemi epidemiolo uh, fuck. epidemiologists, and this marginalization was in turn exacerbated by the illegible illegibility of their symptoms within the official risk classif classifications published by the CDC. It was perhaps inevitable, given this context, that the politics of insurance should become a major focus of AIDS activism by the end of the decade, as the first antiretrovirals became available and people began to live longer. In the late 1980s, ACT UP in New York and San Francisco formed subcommittees, specifically devoted to insurance actions, and were soon joined in this endeavor by ACT UP chapters around the country. ACT UP is routinely caricatured as an organization composed of wealthy white men, but one member of the New York subcommittee recalls that fully one-third of the gay men involved in meetings were uninsured, a fact she attributes to the kind of feminized labor, hairdressing, weaving, temp temping, in which many gay men were employed. Relative to their heterosexual peers, then, even middle-income white men in ACT UP were at the avant-garde of changes in the post-Fordist employment relation. Subject to forms of middle-class insecurity that had long been experienced by white women and that would become endemic to all classes of workers over the following decades. The work of these committees focused, in the first instance, on the exclusionary practices of private insurers, but soon moved on to a much wider and more ambitious critique of the problems associated with Medicaid and the uninsured. In 1990, in 1990, the ACT UP New York subcommittee achieved its first resounding victory when it forced the National Air Tariff or Tariff Controllers, sorry, fuck, when it forced the National Air Traffic Controllers Association to drop Valenti clauses, excluding from coverage those who had acquired HIV voluntarily through sexual contact or drug use. It went on to pursue similar actions against other private insurers across the country.
In San Francisco, the Golden Gate Insurance Committee pressured the state to monitor redlining practices in the private insurance sector and to put an end to disease-specific exclusions and spending caps. After these first interve interventions against private insurers, the Women's and Minority Caucuses within ACT UP pushed the organization to take its actions much farther and focus on the systemic exclusion of low-income HIV-infected women from all forms of social insurance. In the late 1980s, activists from ACT UP, the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, Women's Health Action Mobilization, WAM, and legal aid lawyers put pressure on the CDC to revise its definition of AIDS so as to take account of the indicator diseases affecting women. The CDC was reluctant to introduce these changes, complaining that any revision along the lines proposed by ACT UP would be double the official caseload of AIDS patients and dramatically increase the burden on public services. After the failure of negotiations, activists from ACT UP and WAM staged a mass action against the CDC in early 1990, in which they blockaded the entrance to its headquarters in Atlanta and unfurled a banner on the roof with the words, CDC AIDS definition kills women. In October of that year, Terry McGovern, a lesbian legal aid lawyer working with women prisoners, filed a lawsuit against the HHS, accusing it of knowingly using the CDC's definition of AIDS to restrict the benefits it had, it had to pay. To coincide with the event, ACT UP activists, including many low-income women with AIDS, staged a, pro staged a protest outside the Department of Health and Human Resources office that distributed these benefits. In 1991, the CDC finally offered to compromise, agreeing to add some but not all female-specific opportunistic infections to its official definition of AIDS. Although only a partial victory, the CDC's change of heart had the more important side effect of convincing the Social Security Administration to change its definition of recognizable AIDS, a decision that at last made Medicare, disability benefits, and other services available to women with symptomatic HIV infection, and persuaded many other social service programs to follow suit. By the early 1990s, ACT UP had moved beyond punctual actions against private insurers designed to win benefits for specific classes of, em of employees to articulate a more radical agenda for health insurance reform one that revived the expansive reform agenda of the early 1970s. In 1991, ACT UP joined a, co a coalition of progressive organizations campaigning for universal, single-payer health insurance in the United States, a coalition that helped push health care to the forefront of the Democratic Party agenda during the 1992 presidential campaign. In a brochure distributed at a demonstration in favor of universal health insurance in 1991, one ACT UP member reflected on the political evolution of the group. We've had to fight battle after battle for immediate stopgap measures just to keep people alive. Our targets sometimes seemed scattered. We have not taken the time nor devoted the energy to long-term goals or broad-based solutions. Under pressure from its women's and minority committees, ACT UP had been forced to look beyond the issue of private insurance an issue of most immediate importance to those who would otherwise have access to the middle-class privileges of full-time full employment with benefits, to the systemic failures of the public insurance system. But this widening of political horizons to encompass the gendered and racialized dynamics of economic inequality in the U.S. healthcare system remained controversial within ACT UP itself and ultimately led to its dissolution. For those who saw exclusion from health care as a result of their sexuality alone, the most immediate issues were those of sexual discrimination and access to rights that would otherwise have been their due. Others experienced their outright exclusion from the health care system as a much more complex collusion of sexual, race, and class factors, and it was this more expansive vision that was captured in ACT UP's campaign for, univer for universal health insurance. Same-sex marriage and the ethic of family responsibility.
Following in the footsteps of the welfare rights movement of the 1970s, the AIDS activism of the early 1990s articulated a radical welfare politics. They called for the expansion of social insurance while simultaneously refusing the exclusions of sexual normativity. This pathway was in some sense made necessary by the peculiar history of the American welfare state. The New Deal's never completed reform agenda had left the United States with a fragmented healthcare system, one that reserved privileged workplace benefits to the full-time unionized worker, most often a white man and his wife, while reserving an at an inadequate and expensive public health insurance system for the indigent for the indigent and disabled. Good quality health insurance was contingent on full time employment in a large unionized workplace, or failing that marriage to a man who enjoyed these conditions. Reviving the agenda of radical health care reform that had flourished in the early nineteen seventies, Health activists in ACT UP and allied groups sought to imagine a universal system of health insurance that was no longer tied to the old normative restrictions of the family wage. A system that divorced health care coverage from employment and marital status. Yet these activists were operating in an, in an historical context that was much more inimical to such ambitious horizons of change. After trying and failing to push through with national health care reform in the first years of his administration, Clinton went on to reform welfare as we know it, an intervention that drastically restricted public assistance to impoverished single mothers and made marriage promotion and family responsibility the centerpiece of social policy for the poor. The AIDS activists who campaigned for universal health care therefore found themselves working on two fronts simultaneously, even as they sought to revive the reform agenda of the 1970s left, they also had to confront the increasingly influential ethic of personal and family responsibility associated with neoliberalism. After the defeat of Clinton's health care reform and the subsequent success of his promise to end welfare as we know it, the campaign for same-sex marriage rose to the fore of LGBT uh, activism. The leftist healthcare coalition of the early 1990s had sought to detach collective health insurance from its residual reference to the family wage. The LGBT movement has subsequently moved in the opposite direction. Rather than challenge the limitations intrinsic to the public-private welfare state, it has instead fought for inclusion within an already exclusive system of private work-based health insurance. At a point in time when access to health care coverage through full-time secure employment and by extension marriage has become an increasingly rare proposition, the LGBT movement has devoted much of its energies to attaining this shrinking privilege. The notion that same-sex marriage would ensure access to private health care insurance has thus become a key plank in the reform agenda of LGBT rights advocates. Similar arguments have been made with respect to social security which in the event of premature death provides survivors benefits for, for widowed spouses and children. At a time of shrinking political horizons, same-sex marriage proponents look to the surviving remnants of the family wage, social insurance benefits premised on marital and familial status. To argue that they too should be included in this last vestige of Fortis normativity, the call to recognize same-sex marriage thus becomes a demand for inclusion within a family wage system that is itself in terminal decline. But beyond this, many of the same voices in the same-sex marriage debate simultaneously adopt the neoliberal argument that legal recognition of their unions would ultimately allow same-sex couples to take care of themselves and thus renounce their rights to state welfare altogether. In this optic, the campaign for same-sex marriage no longer entails a demand for inclusion in the family wage system of social insurance, but rather an affirmation of one's ability to live independently of the state. By allowing lesbians and gay men to enter into legally enforceable and long-term obligations of care and mutual support, it is suggested the recognition of gay marriage will induct same-sex couples into a neoliberal ethic of family responsibility. The economist M. V. Lee Badgett, a prominent contributor to legal 
debates around same-sex marriage, cites the work of neoliberal economist Robert A. Pollock to buttress her argument that marriage performs a welfare function comparable to social insurance. Robert Pollock argues that family structures serve other important economic purposes by reducing what economists call transaction costs involved in creating all sorts of agreements between individuals. The pre-existing, ongoing, significant personal relationships present in families give the family some advantages in fulfilling social insurance functions in case of old age, divorce, economic hardship, or illness, for example. Badgett's argument in favor of same-sex marriage rests on the idea, pervasive in the neoliberal literature and ultimately indebted to the poor law tradition of family responsibility, that the legal obligations of marriage should function as a primary source of welfare and the first line of defense against the social risks of ill health, aging, and unemployment. Economies of scale and household production increase the resources available for provisioning within a family. Within this economic context, particular forms of family arrangements and their accompanying legal arrangements seem likely to promote taking advantage of economies of scale more clearly. The promises inherent in marriage include an obligation of mutual support between two individuals, giving individuals in those relationships a higher degree of security in their claims on their partner's resources. With both an explicit personal commitment and a lethal obligation, one spouse cannot refuse to help meet the basic needs of the other. The legal theorist William Eskridge similarly identifies the social insurance function of marriage as one of the prime arguments in its favor. The third goal of marriage is social insurance. Each spouse promises to marry the other for better or for worse, for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, so long as everything is for better, for rich, and in health. Neither the law nor marriage has to do any heavy work. The work starts when something happens for worse, for poor, or in sickness. Marriage is a form of insurance against bad times. To the extent possible, the spouse is required to provide financial and emotional support when things are going badly. In the event of mental or physical breakdown, the nightmare people begin to have when they reach middle age, the unimpaired spouse is trusted to, to be both caretaker and surrogate decision maker. These arguments are not confined to the realm of theoretical debate, but have been pervasive in same-sex marriage campaigns. Badgett, for example, has testified in numerous state high court decisions relating to the legalization of same-sex marriage. Her testimonies focus on both the social insurance and tax advantages that will be opened up to same-sex couples as a result of marriage, and more emphatically on the fiscal savings that will be made available to the state once same-sex couples are authorized to take care of themselves. Ultimately, she concludes the legalization of same-sex marriage will save the state more money than it loses in increased social security payments. The impact of the neoliberal family responsibility argument in favor of same-sex marriage is clearly legible in the following remarks made by Chief Justice Ronald M. George of the California State Supreme Court when asked to rule on the state's interest in excluding same-sex couples from marriage. The legal obligations of support that are an integral part of the marital and family relationships relieve society of the obligation of caring for individuals who may become incapacitated or who are otherwise unable to support themselves. The AIDS epidemic plays a curious role, both catastrophic and redemptive, in the narratives of social progression offered here. William Eskridge merely reiterates a sentiment to be found in the work of many other gay commentators. The Catholic libertarian Andrew Sullivan or the, or the communitarian neoliberal Jonathan Rock, for instance, when he identifies AIDS as the moment of epiphany that turns gay men away from the uninsured risks of promiscuity toward the privatized risk protections of monogamy. The AIDS epidemic that ripped through the 80s not only cast a pall over the sexual freedom of the 70s, but more important, illustrated the value of interpersonal commitment for gay people generally, and not just for safety's sake. To the person with AIDS, the value of a committed partner is incalculable. 
the social insurance feature of marriage has never been so relevant as it has been for people with AIDS. For Jonathan Rock, AIDS is what made a game what made gay men realize that the absence of family structures was literally deadly, an uninsured risk that could only be hedged by claiming the economic and public health protections of married monogamy. So an epidemic that prompted the rigorously anti-normative welfare politics of ACT UP is here rewritten as a traumatic but necessary rite of passage into the world of family responsibility. In the wake of the Regan Revolution and its attempts to revive the poor law tradition of family support, in the wake of Clinton's welfare reforms inscribing marriage promotion at the heart of social policy, the proponents of same-sex marriage seek to include non-heterosexuals in the ethic of family responsibility. In the last instance, what is so striking about these narratives is how closely they hew to the neoliberal logic of Richard Posner and Thomas Philipson, for whom legalized gay marriage represented the ultimate form of privatized risk protection and the perfect solution to moral hazard. If AIDS was the price to pay for irresponsible lifestyle choice, same-sex marriage is now presented as the route to personal and hence familial responsibility.